Hello, I'm Ann Ferris Rosen. I hope you're well, staying home and reading books. Welcome to my virtual reading of Deep South Dispatch, Memoir of a Civil, Civil Rights Journalist, which is now out in paperback. I collaborated on Deep South Dispatch with my father, John Herbers, a former New York Times reporter who covered the civil rights movement for more than a decade. John Herbers was a Forrest Gump of journalism because he witnessed almost every major landmark event of the civil rights movement, beginning with Brown versus Board of Education, to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, to the marches in Selma, Alabama. So Deep South Dispatch speeds along with these deeply personal and vivid accounts, but it's also a poignant coming of age story of a young man living in the segregated Jim Crow South whose basic precepts of the world are challenged by societal upheavals. He's conflicted by his dedication to his heritage and tradition, while also questioning the prescribed laws and mores of an unjust society. What he saw shook the world, the country, and his conscience. It began early when he covered the murder trial of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy who was lynched in Mississippi by white men for allegedly whistling at a white woman. Here's what he wrote. My most lucid memory of the trial was the delivery of the verdict. The facts hinted at a possible just reward, and the defendants looked worried as they sat waiting for their wives. The jury took only 67 minutes to reach a verdict, and one juror told reporters that it would have been sooner had they not taken a break to quench their throats with soda pop. Not guilty, they proclaimed. After sitting in the courtroom for five days and hearing evidence beyond a doubt that the defendants were guilty, the verdict shocked me. Tired and angry, I drank a beer. I got into the car to drive home to Jackson. How would I explain to my wife, Betty, and my two young daughters that something like this happened in America much less in a state we called home. A few miles outside of Sumner, I felt a nagging tongue in the pit of my stomach. I was mentally and physically exhausted. And I was also beginning to see that my long indifference to Southern suppression of Blacks was as displaced as the motives of those who enforced the suppression. I hunched over the steering wheel and cried. I couldn't stop crying for many miles. I wanted to cry Mississippi out of my very core. My father and I worked side by side to complete Deep South Dispatch before he died six weeks after my mother's passing in 2017. During this process, I realized I had been prepared all my life to help him write this book because he took us with him on his assignments. In 1964, my family traveled to St. Augustine, Florida where Martin Luther King Jr. was staging a boycott to defy the laws prohibiting Blacks from using all white facilities. After reporting from St. Augustine for six weeks with no time off, I went home to Atlanta for the weekend to see my family. When I arrived, Betty and our four daughters were standing in the driveway dressed in bathing suits, flip-flops, and floaties ready for a beach trip to, Saint, to Panama City, Florida. As I was packing the car, my editors called and said to get back to St. Augustine because more protesters had arrived and the violence had worsened. Betty and I traditionally built a wall to separate our positive home life from the atrocities I saw daily, but I had been away from my family for so long and could not bear to leave them again. So we made an exception. I looked at my family and said, riots or no fry, riots, we're headed to the beach. At 5 a.m. on the next morning, our family drove to St. Augustine instead of Panama City. I checked my family into a motel on the beach outside of town, and the girls swam in the motel pool. That night, I went to a church eight blocks from the town square where 400 black and white protesters had assembled. King and his booming resonant voice urged them to march tonight like you've never marched before. The next day I drove through another black neighborhood to see if demonstrators were planning a protest. I saw some KKK members writing down my license plate number while I was parked near the town square. 
Some news reporters and cameramen hired bodyguards for protection. I didn't feel it was necessary because even the most violent segregationists understood that attacking the press only brought them unwanted national attention. However, I grew increasingly uneasy about my family's safety, even though they were staying in a motel away from the rioting. Late one night, Betty and I were startled from our sleep by the sound of roaring cars and pickup trucks. A gang of whites drove in circles around the motel, firing their rifles into the air. The hoodlums were content to keep their distance and were probably only intent on scaring us, which they did. After they drove away, Betty and I hurriedly woke the girls, packed them into the back of our turquoise board, and drove them out of town. As I looked at the fading lights of St. Augustine in the rearview mirror, I was relieved to escape harm and return to Atlanta. Within a few days, I was back in St. Augustine, without my family, where King was upping the ante. When a county grand jury proposed a 30-day ceasefire so a biracial committee could be created to negotiate a truce, King immediately rejected the idea and said demonstrations would continue. King agreed to meet me for an interview on a steamy Wednesday afternoon at one of the safe houses where he stayed with host families. It was the only time I saw him without a battery of aides, an audience, or other journalists in the room. Despite the intense pressure of the campaign, he appeared calm and measured as we sat on a screened porch sipping iced tea and orange juice to talk about his goals for the summer. He was short and beefy and dressed immaculately in a snow white shirt. His appearance had changed little since I first met him. He was a little heavier, but there was no flabbiness to him. His broad sloping face and thick neck gave him a sense of power, yet that was the only hint of the extraordinary life he led. It was hard to believe he was only 35 years old, not because of his appearance, but because of the veneration in which he was held by all who were willing to sacrifice their lives for him and the cause. As a black leader, he was unique. The movement's power was fueled by his personality and his ability to arouse an audience that wanted to see, hear, and touch him. As you can see, Deep South Dispatch provides a complex understanding of how the Southern status quo in which the white establishment benefited at the expense of African Americans was disrupted and dismantled by an outcry for justice. My family moved to Washington DC after Selma and my father continued to cover seminal events in, Amer in contemporary American history, including urban riots, presidential campaigns, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Watergate and the resignation of Richard Nixon. John Herbers reunited 50 years later with John Lewis, the civil rights leader who led protesters into a gruesome beating by police in Selma to gain voting rights. He's now a US congressman. We had not seen each other in years, but he still appeared young I was 90 years old, he was only 74. Lewis had lost none of his modesty or humility over the years. Without the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings, Lewis told me during the meeting. There were many brave young men and women using the pen and using the camera to tell the story. We shook hands and embraced his departure. As I watched him walk to his car with his congressional aide, I remembered him as a younger man leading multitudes into uncertain danger with those long ago Southern voices singing, be still my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. Deep South Dispatch is a timely perspective that's particularly relevant today as we continue to grapple with racial bias and inter institutional barriers to equality. I hope this book reminds us that through talking with and listening to someone different from us, be it race, religion, or locale, we can find common ground and that the sharing of stories is an integral part of understanding each other and moving forward together. Thank you for your time and interest. The reading is followed by a short film about Deep South Dispatch. <laughs>
A young reporter witnesses landmark civil rights uprisings in the segregated South he calls home. Yes, it upends the country, but it also shakes his consciousness shakes his own world. He began working as a newspaper reporter in Mississippi in 1949. This is the story of John Herbers, a journalist for the New York Times and United Press International, whose ass assignment for more than a decade was to report on the civil rights movement in the Deep South. Certainly it's a scene that nobody likes to see. He reported on the brutal execution of Willie McGee, a black truck driver in Mississippi convicted of raping a white woman. It received national and international news coverage. And the murder trial of Emmett Till. There had been other incidences like this in Mississippi beforehand, but this one shook the nation. He interviewed icons such as Martin Luther King Jr. We've gone too far now to turn back. Robert Kennedy and John Lewis. This man here <laughs> can tell the story. Who decades later met with Herbers again. I thank you for all you did. Thanks, right? He took readers behind the scenes of the KKK, and he revealed the private grief of the parents of the four black girls who were killed in the Birmingham church bombing. And at his own personal risk, he covered the famous Freedom Summer murders, the riots in St. Augustine, state officers had to use their police baton, and the marches in Selma. In his book, Deep South Dispatch, Memoir of a Civil Rights Journalist, John Herbers offers vivid, first-hand accounts of seminal events in the history of our country. His vulnerability as a journalist allows readers to see how one man can remain dedicated to his Southern family and heritage, but also dedicate his work to exposing and rejecting the prescribed laws and mores of a prejudiced society. Upon hearing the not guilty verdict from an all-white jury in the Emmett Till murder trial, he wrote, I felt a nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach. I hunched over the steering wheel and cried. I couldn't stop and cried for many miles. I wanted to cry to be out of my very core. I was born a black My name is Emmett Till. His retrospective is a timely and critical reflection on America's current racial dilemmas and ongoing quests for justice. Came across for justice to be finally fulfilled. All because of me, a black boy. My name.